Okay, good morning. Um, <clears throat> so, the lectures today are going, going to cover some aspects of the energy landscape approach to uh, glass forming liquids. Um, so, somebody to, on, on the way here was sort of saying how great the lectures had been, and, and, I, and I said, uh, just wait, you know. <laughs> so, I, I, I'm afraid uh, this lecture, the next two lectures are not going to live up to the standards set by the previous ones, but uh, I got the other lectures to get, get uh, those wonderful lectures ready, so that's my contribution. So, <laughs> all right. Um, and, and, of course, whatever uh, isn't particularly clear or illuminating uh, in these two lectures will be made up by David's lectures in the afternoon. So, uh, all right. Um, so, to get going, uh, let me see if this works. Okay. Hmm. <coughs> okay. Um, just to recapitulate some, uh, I'll, I'll start by recapitulating some basic things that have already been covered. And uh, also, let me um, uh, I'm, I'm, in the second lecture, I'm going to try to uh, finish a little bit earlier so that we have more time for the, the poster presentation. So uh, those people who are planning to be presenting the one-minute slides don't uh, be, be around at around 11.30 or so um, instead of 12. Okay. So here is a, a, a graph that's probably been shown a few times, uh, which is a... Uh, 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 plot of the log of the viscosity versus inverse temperature, and uh, <coughs> the observation um, is that the viscosities in a variety of, of liquids uh, behave uh, in a much stronger than Arrhenius fashion with temperature, and uh, appear to, uh, well, and, and are becoming very big, and uh, experimentally, when the viscosity reaches 10 to the 13 poise, which corresponds roughly to relaxation times of uh, tens and hundreds of seconds. Uh, one, uh, 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 one says that the, the liquid has reached the glass transition temperature. And uh, about this temperature, the system, uh, the, the supercool liquid or, or, or any other um, fluid system one is looking at will fall out of equilibrium. And the laboratory glass transition that is described in this way uh, is seen as a, in a wide range of substances and is a kinetic effect in the sense that one is setting a time scale uh, <coughs> which is in turn defining this, this transition temperature. And correspondingly, uh, apologies, uh, if one looks at uh, properties of the glasses that are obtained at low temperatures, um, using different protocols in this, uh, what is uh, attempted to be shown is the volume of, of a, a liquid going into the glass state uh, as a function of uh, different cooling rates. So if you cool the liquid fast, it falls out of equilibrium at a higher temperature, reaches a, a volume that's higher than if it is cooled a little bit slower, and, and, and so on. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so the the properties of the glass that you obtain depend on the method of preparation. <coughs> and uh, going back uh, to the data on uh, <coughs> the, the viscosities, given the diversity of, of temperatures, um, one, but an apparent similarity of pattern, one can ask if there is a simple-minded scaling of, of these data that, that uh, will, will tell us something uh, <coughs> Uh, simple and non-trivial about uh, uh, how, how the viscosities of these materials are changing. And so what one attempts is to scale the, the temperature on the x-axis with the glass transition temperature. And uh, one can ask the question whether such a scaling will lead to uh, data collapse. And the answer that is seen here is no. Uh, what one sees instead is a range of behavior from uh, almost Arrhenius to something that departs very strongly from Arrhenius behavior. How rapidly the
viscosity changes um, for a given material in the scale plot is called the fragility of the glass former. And pictorially, uh, one can attempt to get an index of the fragility by looking at the slope uh, of the viscosity in the scaled plot at the glass transition. Uh, this is, in fact, what, what is done in many cases. So a small slope here uh, for something like uh, Germania uh, is uh, indicative of, of strong behavior, um, low fragility, whereas uh, a much larger slope uh, for, for systems on this end uh, indicates that the fragility is, is large. <clears throat> As you've already heard, <coughs> the viscosity data is often well described by the Fogel, Fulcher, Thurman form, which I've written in a somewhat uh, uh, unusual way. Uh, but basically, there is a divergence temperature T0 at which, by extrapolation, the viscosity will diverge. And the reason I've written it in this fashion is that <coughs> written this way, this number K here uh, can be seen to be uh, also an index of fragility. And, um, okay. um, and, and, and a second reason to, to write uh, it in this way is that, uh, as Walter mentioned already, if one looks at the heat capacities of materials, in particular the excess heat capacities of materials, there is a diversity of, of uh, how the heat capacity, uh, there's a, a range of behaviors of how much uh, the heat capacity changes at the glass transition. And uh, <coughs> um, the magnitude of the jump uh, depends on the fragility. And um, this can be seen. Uh, what is going on? Uh, hmm. What happened? All right, sorry, I, I, I got, got my slides out of sequence. Uh, but um, <coughs> let, me, let me come back to that later on. Um, OK, so um, as, as I'll show in a little bit, the, the jump in the heat capacity can be relate, seen to be related to this number here. Uh, we'll come to that. Um, but the question that one uh, asks in the context of looking at the behavior of a thermodynamic quantity like the uh, uh, heat capacity is whether this is indicative of a thermodynamic transition. And as already has been discussed, um, <coughs> the uh, historical sort of uh, point of, of this question being raised is the observation of Kausman uh, that the excess entropy of, of, of glass formers appears by extrapolation to vanish at, at a finite temperature. And, um, this does not, uh, this, this, this paradox is, is resolved in practice uh, by the intervention of the glass transition before uh, such an eventuality uh, arises. Um, <coughs> the question that many people uh, are interested in understanding uh, uh, is, is whether uh, there is a resolution in principle of an entropy vanishing uh, thermodynamic glass transition. And there are indeed proposals that this is so. Uh, Walter, again, discussed one of those uh, proposals. Um, the quantity that is plotted here is the excess entropy, the entropy of, of the liquid over that of the crystal. And uh, again, as it has been mentioned, uh, since the glass transition, I think Ken mentioned this yesterday, since the glass transition is, is uh, a, a, a liquid state phenomenon, it would be nice to understand the meaning of this uh, purely in terms of the liquid state rather than making reference to the crystal. And uh, so one asks the question, what is the meaning of the excess entropy? And uh, going back to data like this, not very directly, but uh, if, if you notice in this, this particular graph, the heat capacity uh, of the crystal uh, and, and the glass are very similar. And uh, one can uh, deduce or argue from that that the entropies of the glass and the crystal uh, are very similar. And therefore, one can interpret the procedure of subtracting the crystal entropy as 
uh, that of subtracting a component of the liquid entropy that is like the entropy of the glass. Uh, and in both cases, uh, certainly in the case of the crystal, it's clear that this uh, component of the entropy comes from vibrational motion around a well-defined reference structure. And uh, what we're going to understand uh, from here on about the, the corresponding quantity in the case of the liquid is that is also the same, that there is a component of the entropy of the liquid that arises from localized vibrational harmonic or otherwise, and that is the quantity that we are subtracting. And therefore, what we are left with is an entropy that is associated with the multiplicity of distinct structures that the liquid can be in. <clears throat> okay, so um, I probably don't need to go through this because Walter went through this uh, in, 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 in good detail, but uh, the connection to dynamics of these considerations is embedded in the form of the Adam-Gibbs relation, which, which postulates that uh, a liquid can be divided into cooperatively rearranging regions uh, of a size Z, which varies with temperature. And one uh, writes down the probability of rearrangement of these cooperatively rearranging regions in this form, namely that the probability of rearrangement depends exponentially on the size of these regions. <coughs> and uh, one further uh, argues that uh, by the description that we have given it, uh, this uh, hypothetical cooperatively rearranging region uh, or regions will have essentially the same entropy regardless of how big or small these regions might get. And with that assumption, the total configurational entropy of the liquid can be written as or in terms of the number of such regions one would have, that is the total number of particles divided by the size of each of these regions. And if one plugs this back into the uh, probability of transition between uh, di distinct structures that we had in the previous slide, one gets the Adam-Gibbs relation, which relates the relaxation times to the exponential of the inverse of temperature times the configurational entropy. Okay, so again, uh, this uh, um, expression will result in the VFD uh, equation if the, the excess heat capacity uh, is assumed to vary as, as, as some constant divided by the temperature. And from this expression for the excess heat capacity, one can write an expression for the excess entropy uh, by integrating up from a temperature where we assume that this excess uh, entropy vanishes uh, to whatever temperature one is looking at, and that's the resulting uh, expression. And therefore, temperature times the excess entropy will have the form constant times T over Tk minus 1, uh, which is the form in which I wrote the VFT relation earlier. And therefore, written in this way, one can see that the the magnitude of the variation and therefore the jump of the heat capacity at the glass transition uh, can be uh, or is related to uh, the fragility index K that we had in the VFT relation earlier with some multiplicative constants and we're not going to worry too much about it right now. Okay, <clears throat> so that's a, sort of a recap of the necessary uh, context for uh, what I will talk about today, um, which is the energy landscape approach. Uh, and let me start by sort of an intuitive picture of why one thinks this is a useful way of, of looking at relaxation in glassy systems. <coughs> um, unlike ordered materials like crystals, uh, liquids have a disordered structure. And the potential energy, if one looks at the relevant set of of configurations uh, in a liquid is a complicated function of coordinates of the particles with many local minima. And, and uh, uh, to a first approximation, this is what one means by saying energy landscape. But one has in mind uh, more. Um, uh, but before that, uh, let me say in a different way what the meaning of these local energy minima are. So these are local 
minima of the potential energy, which means that uh, we are talking about mechanically stable configurations of particles. And um, it has come up earlier in, uh, in, in the school that one of the things that one is interested in looking at uh, in the context of understanding the behavior of liquids and, and glasses is the packing of particles, uh, which is a business started by this man here, J.D. Bernal. And uh, uh, as it has been clear from uh, that, that, that seminal, the seminal work of Bernal, there are, and, and it's also fairly obvious, uh, if one tries to build mechanically stable packings of particles, uh, there are many different ways of doing so. Okay? Uh, so the energy minima that we are talking about, one can sort of have a real space picture as packings of particles which are mechanically stable, and uh, the, the meaning of packing may uh, differ depending on the interactions that one has. Um, in the case of uh, sort of uh, uh, spherically symmetric uh, atoms or close to spherically symmetric uh, molecules, uh, without directional interactions, a packing is sort of has the meaning of uh, what, what we normally understand in, 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 in everyday language, but um, it, if you do have directional interactions, the meaning changes a little bit, but the general idea is the same. Okay, now, <clears throat> when one talks about the energy landscape, in addition to just sort of the statement that there are many local minima, one has in mind that this complicated structure of the potential energy surface is actually relevant, okay? Uh, to the physics that one is interested in. Um, so as a contrast, um, if you have uh, a liquid or a low density uh, fluid, uh, it's also true that the structure is disordered and, and the, the, the configuration space that is relevant is um, characterized by many local energy minima, but we don't choose to look at the problem that way because the variations that one samples uh, is not very relevant to what one might be interested in, in looking at. For example, if all the states one is interested in have much higher energies than the variation in the potential energy surface, then it's not relevant. Okay, so one, when one says energy landscape, one has in mind that it's actually relevant. Okay, and, and one of the things that we have to do is to establish that, in fact, uh, the energy surface that is seen by the system uh, in, in, in the temperature and density range of, of interest, uh, or, or let me say, um, <coughs> yeah, is, is relevant to the dynamics of the system. Okay, um, so one uh, intuitively expects that this should be the case. Um, when one looks at the system at very low temperatures, because when we decrease the temperature, the energies uh, of interaction become more relevant, and, uh, <clears throat> and at high densities, because this also will, will have the influence of making the interactions in the problem uh, more, more relevant. Okay, so um, again, generically, one should expect that if one were to lower the temperature of the system, the local energy minima that one samples uh, become deeper, and uh, it should get perhaps harder to go from one to the other. And this would have the consequence of increasing the relaxation times. Okay? And as a matter of terminology, these local energy minima, uh, potential energy minima, I'm um, going to refer to as, as inherent structures after uh, Stillinger and Weber who coined the terminology. Okay, so before sort of going on further, <coughs> let's take, um, oof, I was going to say an example where what you see is what you get, but you can't actually see it, <laughs> but shoot. Um, okay, so uh, what is shown, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry about this, but uh, uh, if you look hard, let me trace it for you once, there is a potential energy function that goes like this, okay? And uh, so I'm, I'm treating a toy example where I have a particle 
in one dimension which moves subject to an external potential that is sketched here. Okay? <clears throat> and uh, what I have shown here is a space-time plot of the mo movement of this particle subject to some stochastic, well, this is a Monte Carlo simulation. And I show this <clears throat> particle moving around, moving about at different temperatures, uh, going from a high temperature, which is black, uh, intermediate temperature that's red, and a low temperature that's blue. Okay? What you see is that at, at, at the highest temperature, the particle is sort of making a fairly random walk across uh, the, the space. And when you go to the intermediate temperature, <clears throat> what one finds is that <clears throat> there, are, there are sort of patches of red here, 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 etc., where the system sort of stays localized for longish periods of time. And uh, if you could see what I can see, you would, you would uh, notice that the, the place where it's localized is around <clears throat> a, a minimum of the, the, the potential energy uh, that, that, I <clears throat> that I have down here. <clears throat> and at the lowest temperature, indeed, uh, for very long times, except for brief excursions, uh, this, this particle gets trapped in one of the local energy minima. <clears throat> okay, so in this example, clearly, the, the fact that I have a complicated energy surface uh, is relevant to the dynamics of the, uh, of, of the particle. And <clears throat> a second point I want you to notice here <clears throat> is that even though the, the, the particle is getting trapped uh, at low temperatures around a local energy minimum, it has no difficulty in sampling rapidly the basin of one of these minima. Okay? So that you can sort of judge by how, how fast it seems to be going back and forth, and that's always a rapid uh, uh, sampling. <clears throat> yeah. Hmm? yeah so, uh, <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I told the depth is uh, the smallest. Uh, it's not a global minimum, and that's <coughs> okay. So uh, that's a relevant point. Uh, the the point is, you know, if if I looked at this system for very long, right, I would have a sampling of the different basins. Uh, let's let's assume that the system is ergodic, right? Which means that it'll go all across the, uh, the the energy landscape, and which particular minima it'll sample. Or if if I now sort of transform the problem not into this real space, but I, I say let me look at the problem as a function of energy of the minima, and if, and if I ask the question which is the basin that it is sampling. Right? Um, at, at high temperatures, it basically doesn't care about the depth of the minima. Right? And as I go to lower temperatures, if the system still continues to be ergodic, right, then it will eventually sort of find an equilibrium probability distribution that will be biased towards the lower energy minima that one has. Right? But on this time scale, the system is actually stuck in the lowest temperature that I'm, I've, I've done this. Uh, simulation. Okay, so the mean, the, so the particular minimum that it is stuck in, is not significant as a characterization of the equilibrium probability distribution. Who, oh, where? Correct. So in, in this particular illustration, uh, for each of the, uh, the, the, the trajectories, the temperature is fixed. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, some observations. Uh, the first one I already mentioned is that the, the equilibration uh, in, in each of the basins of the local energy minima 
is, is always rapid, okay. Um, at intermediate temperatures, okay, so in, in, the, in the one dimensional problem, uh, a basin is easy to define, which is, <coughs> so if this is my energy surface, the basin is defined as the subset of the phase space, which is <coughs> uh, between these, if, if I'm talking about this particular minimum, the basin of this minimum is this subset of the set of possible configurations. Uh, and, and one way of identifying, which is generally how we do it, is that if I were to start at some arbitrary configuration here, and I subject the system to uh, uh, a local energy minimization, then I map to this particular minimum. Okay, so that's, that's how one talks about local energy minima, and, and the basin is simply the set of all points uh, that, that maps to a particular minimum. <coughs> okay. <coughs> um, <coughs> okay, so the other observation uh, is that at intermediate temperatures, there is transient localization of the particle uh, <coughs> in the basins of different minima at different times, and at the lowest temperature that we uh, looked at, the system gets trapped in a local minimum for very long times. And um, in order to explore the full phase space, uh, this is the, the particle has to cross energy barriers. Okay, and um, more generally, uh, when one is sort of talking about realistic systems, the barriers don't only have to be uh, energetic, but also entropic. And, and a, a standard example is if one is looking at uh, a hard sphere, uh, a fluid, then there there is no energy barrier in the problem, but the system has to find very special trajectories in phase space that lead to a structural rearrangement. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, what I mean by an entropic barrier is simply that, so let's imagine that, okay, for simplicity, let, let me take a two-dimensional problem, right? Um, so, I have a particle sitting here, and uh, if it's, it's thermalized in, 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 in the momenta, right? It'll, it'll basically have at different times uh, velocities in all different directions, okay? And let's imagine that there are only these two holes, actually I, I, I left out when I drew the box, uh, through which the particle can escape this box, okay? So if you look at the particle for short times, it is actually trapped because, uh, you know, since it's uh, a blind walker, it's, uh, it'll keep doing this, right? So it won't find the door, right? But it's only um, by either sort of finding that particular initial condition that directly takes it to, through the door or through many collisions and, and exploration of, of the momentum uh, mo uh, the set of momenta that are available to it that will eventually find the door. So this is uh, what one has in mind uh, when one talks about an entropic barrier. Okay, and this, this is uh, something that is, is uh, applicable as a notion in, in this example as well as in, in any higher dimensional space. Yeah. Say that again. Uh, what do you mean by sensitive? Okay, why don't we come to this? Okay, I mean, see, the, the point is, um, depending on the temperature, 
there is always a most probable uh, range of, of the values of the energy of the minima. And how we calculate that, I'll, I'll go, yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, so, <coughs> so what I'm trying to describe is that uh, if I were to, like I said, if I were to look at uh, 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 an equilibrium probability distribution, uh, this probability distribution, let's say, at, at sufficiently low temperatures, uh, is, is localized in different parts of the phase space. I mean, if, if I apply some threshold, right? Uh, but uh, at long times, the system has to go, th go to all of those pockets, all of those equivalent pockets, okay, in the simplest case. And, and so the barrier is between one such pocket to another such pocket. Uh, or for transitions between groups of local minima or for multi-barrier steps. The entropic barrier is always explicit within every rate theory derivation that you can produce. So if it's just between two minima, then it's a ratio of, uh, in the harmonic approximation, it's a ratio of vibrational uh, normal mode frequencies. But then uh, if you have a complicated landscape and you want a multi-step pathway, then it becomes a, an interesting convolution of those different barriers, uh, of, of those different sets of... Um, well, actually, it's, it's defined by the ratio of the uh, density of states in a dividing surface divided by the density of states in a minimum. But it's always explicit in every rate theory. So you can separate an entropic part from a potential energy or an enthalpic part. Um. Not exactly. I mean, basically, uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, uh, the system will go from one region of the phase space to the other if it finds a path, okay? And, and, and what we are asking is, what is the probability of finding that path, right? So the, if, if, if one is talking about a simple-minded, one-dimensional energy barrier, that probability is given by a Boltzmann uh, Wait for for crossing, you know, getting up that high in energy, right? But if if you if you're looking at a multidimensional uh, problem, as as uh, David mentioned, also the 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 factors of entropy, meaning how big the door is, will will enter, okay? Or how wide the barrier is, which is which is implicit uh, in in uh, sort of rate expressions. Uh, in the form of a frequency that goes in the denominator uh, in the orthogonal direction. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, so, um, right. Now, of course, uh, as soon as we sort of leave toy examples, uh, one can't really be drawing explicitly the energy surface one is talking about, so one must uh, go on to a statistical description of the problem. And uh, so here, uh, let's start by doing that for this <laughs> invisible potential energy surface. Uh, so, you know, but simple mind, I mean, without even seeing what that function looks like, if one asks, what is a, uh, a good statistical description of the energy surface that one is talking about, since we're focusing attention at the moment on, on energy minima, uh, one obvious quantity is to just make a histogram of the, the number of minima that I have in, I, as a function of the energy of the bins uh, into which I, I, I categorize them, okay? So that is uh, given here. So I have, I define this quantity N of phi as the number of minima in an interval phi and, and phi plus delta phi. And <clears throat> once I have defined this distribution, um, I can, in, in, in following standard practice, define a, an entropy density, right? Uh, since I'm talking about a multiplicity of states, 
uh, the log of that multiplicity of states uh, gives me an entropy, which I'm going to call the configurational entropy. Okay, and um, this is an entropy density. Uh, if if I okay, but as, which is a function of the energy that I'm talking about. But if I now say that at any given temperature I have some uh, most probable value of the uh, of the energy that I sample of the minima, then I can talk about a temperature dependent configurational entropy that I can calculate in a straightforward way. Okay, um, right. So with that uh, introduction, uh, let me now go on to uh, <coughs> talking about the potential energy landscape picture in the context of supercool liquids. And, and this uh, set of ideas goes back to Martin Goldstein uh, back uh, 40 years ago. Uh, and, and he, uh, based on various considerations, uh, argued that at low temperatures, when the relaxation times become of the order of nanoseconds, um, <coughs> the relaxation uh, or flow, as he calls it, is dominated by potential energy barriers, potential barriers high compared to thermal energies, uh, which have to be crossed in order for the system to relax. Okay, and uh, subsequently, uh, this was sort of revisited by Stillinger and Weber, who also undertook a series of of uh, computer simulation studies, uh, where they also coined this term, inherent structures, and, and attempted to formulate uh, the thermodynamics of, of, a, of a liquid in terms of, of uh, these local energy minima and, and their basins, the properties of the basins uh, surrounding them. Okay, so um, again, um, since one talks about different energy landscapes, uh, just to sort of be clear, uh, what we are talking about now is is just, in simple words, the the potential energy of a three three n or an n particle system, uh, which is a surface uh, in in, a, in three n plus one dimensional space uh, as a function of three n coordinates. Okay, and uh, here it, it is in two dimensions. Uh, so I, I just uh, have a cartoon of a a, a a potential energy surface in two dimensions, and what, you know, each of these minima is, is called an inherent structure, and the black lines that, that are shown here separate the basins of, of each of these minima, okay? Well, plus one is because if you have a function so, so 3n is, is the number of independent variables, and uh, then you're plotting a function of this 3n variable, so that's the plus one, okay? It could be plus or minus a few depending on, you know, conserved quantities and so on, but yeah, that, this is assuming that all configurations are available. Okay. <coughs> okay, so anyway, the point is this energy surface or landscape is a function which is independent of anything. It's, it's dependent on the Hamiltonian of the problem, but what is dependent on the temperature, and that's what we're going to be talking about, uh, is the part of this surface that is sampled, okay? This will depend on the temperature. So not the surface, but, but what we sample in this surface. <coughs> okay, so as I alluded to uh, in referring to Stillinger and Weber, a lot of the work in, in, in uh, studying the potential energy landscape uh, has been uh, done through computer simulations. And, and uh, uh, so this is sort of uh, <coughs> um, a mixed bag because uh, it's, it's one of the, you know, if you, if you want to sort of look at the uh, sort of positive side of it, it's, it's one of the... Uh, types of analysis where computer simulations play an essential role as experiments, okay? So you're looking at uh, quantities in principle, uh, 
which you don't have direct experimental access to, but you believe are important for understanding what you're trying to understand, namely the relaxation of, of, of a liquid. And therefore, computer simulations are, are very handy. Uh, it's also a negative because ultimately one would like to have a direct access to the quantities one invokes in an analysis, but that's unfortunately not the case here, okay? So on, on the other hand, one can sort of use the energy landscape quantities as an intermediate and try to relate quantities that are directly experimentally measured. Okay, um, so just to, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not going to repeat this for the rest of the talk, so just to sort of summarize what one does typically, uh, uh, one, one is looking at uh, molecular dynamic simulations uh, to generate a trajectory in configuration space uh, of a collection of interacting particles under typically constant energy or temperature conditions, and uh, this is sort of standard stuff. Um, in looking at the energy landscape, uh, what one does typically is to take one of these trajectories, that is the, the cartoon of which is shown in two dimensions here, and take samples along the way. These black dots are, are, are samples of the configurations that I, I, I take out from the trajectory. So I, I have a discrete time series, and I subject them to a local energy minimization so that this, this, this configuration mapped to that minimum, that, that, that instantaneous configurations mapped to that minimum. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so by doing so, one generates a statistics, uh, well, this is sort of, if, if one is doing energy minimization, one can do other things, but uh, by, by doing this, one is generating a statistics of the local energy minima that are sampled, and one can then calculate the properties of these. Of course, in a normal molecular dynamic study, one is also looking at uh, the dynamics of the li liquid, which is probed through the diffusion of particles, density correlation functions, etc. So the object will be to correlate these two uh, types of quantities uh, one calculates. Therefore, you're saying you cannot use statistical mechanics to generate the statistics, right? No. I said in that toy example, uh -huh. at the lowest temperature, I was working with time scales that are lower than their ergodic okay. time scales, but, but not, not now, not anymore. So now, well, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, there will be, um, <clears throat> so, uh, no, so if, if uh, okay, if you want anybody to believe a computer simulation that you've done of, of a super cool liquid, you have to demonstrate that you've, you've done an equilibrium sampling, Un unless, that's not your goal. I mean, <laughs> sorry, not that's, I don't mean to convince other people, but uh, you could, you could, so there are, there are special cases where you are looking at out of equilibrium behavior, okay? But if, if unless explicitly stated, uh, you assume that uh, the, 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 the liquid you're looking at is uh, sampling its configuration space ergodic, okay? Um, okay, so, um, so here, I, I sort of, uh, so as I said, one of the things that we have to demonstrate is, is that the, the sampling of the energy landscape is actually relevant for the physics we're interested in. And, and here I go through uh, <coughs> a study of the Cobb-Anderson uh, binary Leonard-Jones mixture, which is a, a, a widely studied model system for, uh, sorry, I keep coming in your way, I think. Um, <coughs> uh, and uh, so what is done here is to simulate the liquid. And here is actually a case where one doesn't a priori ensure that the liquid is in equilibrium, okay? Uh, so what one is doing is to take the liquid starting at some high temperature and to cool it uh, at a constant rate, okay? Uh, like one might do uh, in, a, in a typical glass formation study, right? You take the liquid where, where it's ergodic, and then you cool it at a constant rate. And then you look at what happens, okay? The particular quantity we're looking at here is the energy of the inherent structures that one samples in the manner that I described, the average energy as a function of temperature, okay? So 
one does this at different cooling rates, and one has these three following observations. One is that at, at high temperatures, the energy of the uh, inherent structures, the average energy, is nearly constant. Okay? It doesn't vary very much with temperature. Okay? The second observation is that below some, some temperature, the energy of the inherent structures uh, begins to go to lower and lower values. And the third observation is that at sufficiently low temperatures, it gets stuck at different values that depend on the cooling rate. Okay? This last uh, observation uh, pertains to the fact that the system is actually falling out of equilibrium, and uh, it is falling out of equilibrium at temperatures and energies of the local minima that depend systematically on the cooling rate. Okay? And more, more concretely, uh, if one were to sort of take pains to do that analysis, the, the temperature at which uh, the system falls out of equilibrium, uh, just like in the discussion of the glass transition experimentally, um, corresponds to a relaxation time that uh, is proportional to the cooling rate. Okay? So, uh, this is in fact, if you will, uh, one way of, of, of uh, determining the glass transition, uh, the computer simulation equivalent of uh, the glass transition for this liquid. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious, why does it get stuck so flat in energy? In other words, if you did it, I mean, this isn't the density, but if you did a, a volume plot, there's a slope to that. And I've seen this in density pictures of sim certain simulations, too, where it gets really much flatter than what's observed experimentally. And I'm just wondering wh why that is. Okay, the reason is, okay, so let me first address the volume part of it, right? Which is, uh, when you're looking at the local energy minima, right? you are actually removing from consideration uh, any expansion or contraction that has to do with just vibrational motion and harmonic vibrational motion. Okay? So it will be, so if I were to plot in, in an appropriate simulation the volume of the, of, of the local energy minima, it will be flatter because it doesn't have any uh, even vibrational expansion, okay? which is there in the real system. And the same applies to this. Okay, so um, so the the um, the, the temperature uh, below which the deeper minima are sampled uh, is I'm going to call it the onset temperature, and uh, if one then goes and looks at the dynamics of the system, so here I've just reproduced one of those curves that I showed in the previous graph, and again invisible. Does anybody know what to do? With this, um, is there some color? Color? Hmm? Yeah. Okay. Well, if if it happens too often, uh, let's we'll try and do that. Yeah. Just uh, try once. <laughs> Should I keep talking? Can you do? It? Okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe not. energy, okay? And uh, if I do that, um, what I see <clears throat> for this particular system is that at high temperatures, the so-called activation energy is a, is a number, it's a constant, and uh, that's sort of what I expect uh, if, if I have Arrhenius behavior. But what I also find is that below the temperature at which I begin to see this drop in the inherent structure energies, uh, this, this effective activation energy is becoming bigger and bigger. Okay? This means that um, when the system uh, begins to, do, to sample deeper energy minima, uh, my effective activation energy is becoming larger. Okay? So what this tells us is that below this onset temperature, the energy landscape, it's actually meaningful to talk of an energy landscape. 
okay, that the sampling of the minima uh, on, on my potential energy surface seems to correlate with changes that I see in the dynamics. <laughs> okay, so I'm not, I'm not showing uh, what happens down there. Basically, when it gets stuck, you, your, your uh, relaxation time you cannot measure because you're not doing a long enough uh, simulation at those temperatures for the system to be in equilibrium which is a precondition for you to measure a correlation, uh, 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 relaxation time. So, is there, is there a priori some relationship that we should expect between the depth of the energy minima and the height of the barrier? I mean, is it obvious? It's not immediately obvious to me why those two have to be correlated like that. Well, um, if you expect that there is some threshold energy to which you have to rise to before you, you can sort of go on to exploring other parts of the free uh, energy surface, then there, there would be an obvious correlation. And that's indeed, that seems to be the case, though I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, there, there is, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, correct. Yeah. No. So basically, just to paraphrase what Walter is saying, I could take uh, an energy surface that corresponds to some Hamiltonian, and I can construct another energy surface with bigger barriers, right? right between. So. This you can do, and in fact, people have done that, including uh, some of the luminaries that I've mentioned. But I think it's a little bit, uh, I mean, okay, it's, some, it's a cautionary note that one should keep in mind, but one shouldn't sort of get carried away with that kind of logic, right? And, and I think uh, uh, for, for having a realistic idea of what structure one should look at, one should look at the, the detailed connectivity of the configuration space which David is going to tell you a lot all about. Okay. No, I had, I had just, just also points, I think because it is always confusing when we are looking at, at those quantities, is that the, the energy of the depth is proportional to the size of your system. And, and the, the barrier is, is always proportional to a small number of particles. So, so it, it shouldn't be confused about something which is... Okay size of the volume and something which is, which is of order one. I think this okay. is... Okay. Um, this is... Um, uh, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but one should also keep in mind, I mean, there's sort of, there's a double negative here, which is that if one is actually going to be thinking about relaxation in some region of the space, the, the extensivity of the energy the total energy of the minima is not relevant, okay? So I, I guess the, the mental construction that you have to make is that you're looking at a system that's just the right size, that your correlation lengths are not larger than your system size, but it's not too big compared to your correlation lengths. Okay, these are sort of the experts. Um, okay, um, right, did I go back? Yes? No? I guess I just, this is a, okay, repetition. Okay. Um, okay, so now that's, that's regarding the, the, the time dependence of the, the, the relaxation times. The way I got to that was by looking at uh, quantities that are shown here, which, with the, so in this particular case, it's a self part of the Van Hover correlation function, which has been introduced to you, and I'm looking at it at, at different temperatures. And as I go to low temperatures, as uh, Walter already, or did you also this? Okay, one of one of the previous uh, lecturers described. One is developing a plateau, looking at the the time on the log scale. And in any case, for for us, uh, what is important is that the relaxation times are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, what is also uh, seen is that the form of this long time relaxation changes. Uh, from an exponential to a stretched exponential uh, form. And uh, so what I show here for a, a different system, not the Cobb-Anderson 
mixture where also this this is seen uh, is uh, in well on this side of the axis uh, is the stretch exponent in the in the kWw fit to the long time relaxation of these quantities and what you find is that as the inherent structure energies decrease begin to drop which is shown uh, on the left hand side of the of the the graph uh, so also does the kWw functional form so what that means is that not only is so if I had tried to construct a picture uh, well, so the simplest picture I could make is that I have sort of some lid to which I have to get to. Uh, so if I, if I am sampling uh, deeper minima, I have a, a larger uh, energy barrier, but that will not be sufficient to to explain the the fact that the the dynamics is also getting more complicated. Okay, so there are two things that are happening. One is that the effective energy barriers are getting bigger, but the nature of the dynamics is becoming more complex as as quantified by I, I guess that uh, there's a, a, a question here because a huge amount of experimental data says that time temperature superposition is a reasonable approximation. I'm not saying it's an exact approximation. So this, if you actually have a KWW function as opposed to just a fit over some time window that is changing, this suggests that you have very strong deviations from time temperature superposition. Right. Okay, well, so that first question is why okay. is, is that then a problem with this particular simulation model uh, compared to reality, I guess. Okay. But the second question is? Well, then the other possibility is that, in fact, you don't have a KWW function and you really do have time temperature superposition, but the segment of time over which you can fit that function is not big enough to actually find what the real function is. Okay. So, and we've um, seen that. I mean, we, we, we have samples where we take in and we can you can do individual KWW fits to the data you take, right. but when you change temperature, it looks like the KWW function factor is a function of temperature, but in fact, you, if you take the curves and fit the, shift them manually, you get time temperature superposition. So the master curve is not KWW. Okay. okay. So um, my answer to this, and, and, and I think uh, there are people who will disagree. Uh, so le let me ask you a, a counter question, which is if, if I take a a glass former where I have sufficient range in experiments in, in temperature, uh, if I go to sort of near boiling point temperatures, do you expect uh, stretched exponential relaxation? No. No. But uh, hypothetically, if it's a, a, a fragile glass former, near the glass transition, do you expect uh, KWW? Yes. I would say some non-exponential decay. No, some non-exponential decay. So, um, so my understanding of, of this apparent uh, contradiction is that uh, both experimentally and also in, in some of the theoretical discussion, uh, one has in mind a relatively narrow range of temperatures near the glass transition uh, where the relaxation times are actually changing a lot. Right? So one makes sort of a, a comparative statement that while the relaxation times are changing by orders of magnitude, there is no change in the KWW. So I, I, I would be happy with uh, if, if somebody said for six, de six decades above the, the glass transition temperature, you have time temperature superposition. Well, I mean, <laughs> no, we, we, I... I I, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, well, Walter probably has something to say. Yeah. No, I, I, I want to attack you, but <laughs> basically in the same direction. Um, because uh, if you take the case of silica, um, again, BKS, so yeah, yeah. it is what it is. There, um, I would expect that the energy landscape also goes down. Um, but um, the simulation show that uh, the beta is first high, goes down, and then comes up again because the transport properties are changing. Yeah. So um, this correlation, I mean, granted, what I leave to you 
or I believe is that um, something is happening at this onset temperature. The rest, I don't buy it. The rest meaning what? Well, that they, they are tracking each other. No, this, this, this. So this, you don't buy it either? No, no, so exactly <laughs> like this, no, right? Okay. I, I, I show it because okay, it's so that's easy what to I want see to us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but no, but in the case of silica, uh, what is happening is presumably and at lower temperature than this, at lower frequency. So the, when the, the, the uh, temperature domain and the frequency domain that when this crossover shows up is higher temperature, way above gas transition temperature, at high, very high frequency, which can be found by neutron diffraction, or well, neutron scatter, in scatter scattering. And that's the, uh, uh, the intermediate function that he showed. So neutron scattering would show this crossover, not the regular measurement. Oh, value. well, no, no, so that, that may well happen, and, and, but we're not looking at sufficiently low temperatures here to see that. So the, that's why I asked yeah, no, I can't answer it offhand, but if you're talking about the experimental TG, it's way below, so we're nowhere near, I mean, right? That's within 30 degrees, so it's Yeah, for this system, I, I, I don't know if it has actually been estimated in terms of um, whatever method, right? So, okay, um, but, um, okay, I don't, I don't have, uh, in the Cobanderson system, there have been estimates of TK, so one could, in principle, get a TG value. So there, there it's, uh, just to give you numbers, I mean, the, the simulation range is down to reduced temperatures of about 0.45, and TK is 0.3. But, but the point, I mean, but I, I don't think the temperature range is really, quantitatively relevant. I think it's what's happening to the dynamics, what's happening to the thermodynamics of the system, and, and uh, you know, saying that you're within 40% of TG doesn't have much meaning, no? So, okay. Um, okay, so anyway, so that was sort of, um, that, that was just to, you know, so all of, all of that discussion was to say that the emergence of interesting dynamics in the liquid is associated with a non-trivial sampling of the potential energy surface. And uh, so the next uh, item that I'll go through quickly before we, we stop is um, something called the Goldstein crossover, uh, which, which I made reference to earlier. Uh, so Goldstein argued that uh, there is a crossover to activated dynamics when relaxation times uh, reach um, the range of nanoseconds. And subsequent sort of discussion has associated with, associated the Goldstein crossover with the mode coupling temperature, which you will hear about tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow, day after tomorrow. Um, and uh, okay, so the, the idea, uh, the physical picture one has of what happens in this temperature range is that there is a, a, a good separation of vibrational and activated dynamics, okay? And uh, as sort of sketched here, um, and uh, so one can sort of probe this by asking, if I were to look at the dynamics of the system, uh, not by, by analyzing the trajectory of, of uh, instantaneous configurations, but at each point in time, let's say, I, I map my system to uh, the local energy minima, right? And I'll consider the time series of local energy minima. How, how will my, my relaxation functions, etc., look? And if indeed there is a very clear separation between vibrational and relaxational uh, mo motions in the system, uh, one should see that uh, the time correlation functions, um, well, let me, let me just go to it. So what, what one is doing is, is one takes an MD trajectory, like, like shown here schematically. This is uh, the work of Thomas Schroeder and, and others. Uh, uh, and one maps at each instant uh, the system to the local energy minimum, and uh, one then has a time series of local energy minima, and one looks at time correlation functions in the same way one does for the instantaneous configurations. And what one finds is, is, is uh, shown here. This is 
the self part again of the Van Hover correlation function uh, for the, the MD trajectory, right? Uh, what one finds is that the, the, the usual development of a plateau and the, the amplitude of the plateau is roughly uh, constant, uh, which is expected. Um, um, and whereas one, if one looks at the inherent structure uh, dynamics, what one finds is that as one goes to low temperatures, the long time relaxation uh, behavior extends uh, to lower and lower times, and the amplitude of the plateau is, is increasing to, to 1. Okay, this is shown quantitatively uh, here. Uh, this is the non-ergodicity parameter as a function of temperature for the instantaneous, uh, uh, sorry, for the, for the MD trajectory, and this is the non-ergodicity factor uh, for, for the inherent structure uh, dynamics. And what is also shown here um, for, for reference to sort of ensure that one is doing something sensible as far as looking at the long time dynamics of the system is a comparison of the relaxation times. So there are two sets of symbols here. Uh, as usual, one of them you can't see. Um, and, and here also there are two sets of symbols uh, which, which basically fall on top of each other. And uh, this is the the relaxation times from the MD trajectory versus the relaxation times from the inherent structure uh, dynamics, and similarly the stretch exponent. And, and what you see is that, in fact, uh, the long time dynamics as described by the sequence, the time series of local minima is the same, uh, but what is different is uh, what, what is happening to the plateau in the dynamics, which disappears. Uh, so, so this is a measure of the statement that there is a clear separation between vibrational and basin hopping dynamics. Uh, this is made a little bit, uh, yep. Please go back to one more. Could you please comment on the logarithmic <sighs> Yeah, no, it's something that uh, is very interesting and, and should be looked at, but uh, I, I don't. I don't have. I mean, this this looks like aging dynamics, but uh, I don't have more to say. Um, yeah, um, yeah. But it's someday somebody should look at it. Um, okay. Yeah. This. This one. Well, um, no, so if, if I'm looking at the, the, the dynamics of hops between local energy minima, uh, there is no vibrational relaxation, right? So there's only uh, relaxation through hopping between minima. And what this is indicating is that as you go to this, this mode coupling temperature, um, The, there, there are no different regimes in time to this dynamics, right? So, uh, yes, no, maybe. What? Right. Yeah. So, um, so each of the transitions is contributing to the the, the long time decay. Okay, but you know, but I, I, it's it's not a a, a very rigorous uh, statement. But what I'm showing next is to sort of flesh that out a little bit more, which is um, um, looking at, at at the saddle points, which is something that I haven't talked about, but uh, just briefly, and I think. Uh, yeah, um, just as I can map my instantaneous configurations to uh, local energy minima, I can also ask the question uh, with some ambiguity, actually, whether what is the closest saddle point to uh, the, the, the instantaneous configuration that I'm, 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 I'm uh, starting with. And, and I can ask what 
uh, what is the index of that saddle point, how many uh, downhill directions I have. Since I have a three n dimensional configuration space, um, I can have, so uh, I can have a saddle point which is a, I guess called a transition state which is a single uh, direction which is, which is uh, downhill. Um, but I could have also multiple directions that are downhill and the rest uphill at the saddle point, okay. So the saddle point is, is, is defined as a point where the, the, the force, the gradient of the potential is zero, but this can happen either because you're sitting at a minimum or you're sitting at a, a, a critical point of this kind. Um, so, uh, you know, since, I mean, according to Goldstein's uh, conjecture, uh, what should happen if I go to sufficiently low temperature is that the system is uh, close to local energy minima most of the time and, and I therefore have crossing of, of barriers, okay. And uh, if that is true, what should happen is that uh, the index of the saddle points that I look at uh, as a function of temperature should approach uh, zero as I approach uh, the temperature where I expect this crossover to a barrier hopping picture, okay. And that is indeed what one sees. So this is uh, for comparison but not uh, uh, something to worry about too much. I can look at the number of negative eigenvalues of my curvature matrix uh, at a given uh, point in space and this, this decreases but doesn't go anywhere near zero. What is shown on the y-axis here is the number of negative eigenvalues divided by the total number of eigenvalues, okay. Uh, on the other hand, if one looks at the, the, the saddle points that, that I map my instantaneous configuration to, um, one does indeed see that this uh, index uh, fraction is approaching uh, zero uh, at, at some finite temperature and um, correspondingly if one looks at the energy I make a com or these guys made a comparison between the instantaneous energy of the system the inherent structure energy of the system which shows this uh, behavior that I've already described of being relatively flat at high temperatures and then dropping down and uh, the energy of the, the, the nearest saddle points, uh, what one sees is that the energy of the, the closest saddle points on average is approaching that of the local energy minima, okay, which is an indication that there is a change in the character of, of the dynamics uh, that is emerging as one goes to this crossover temperature. Okay, so changes in the nature of the dynamics captured by the properties of the sampled energy surface is the take home message of that segment. Uh, we'll stop for coffee. Yeah, questions. So, good question. Hmm. I, I do not understand exactly what was the difference between plot A and B in my previous slide. A and B? Yeah. This is the instantaneous configuration. Yeah. The right. Okay. Now the point is, uh, you know, some of the the qualitative pictures you have um, will will work quantitatively if you have well-behaved uh, energy landscapes. But uh, in in any realistic system, there are lots of anhomogeneities which may not be significant for the kind of qualitative description that we want to have. Um, so you will have, uh, even if you, for example, had uh, only an energy minimum, uh, you could have anhomogeneities that lead to negative eigenvalues, right, without barrier crossing. So what is attempted to be done here is to sort of clean up by, by mapping the system to the closest uh, saddle point. Any other questions? Yeah. Here, uh, may well happen. Um, I think uh, 
not for this system, but um, for for silica. Silica seems to be uh, uh, so. So you know, this it, it doesn't quite go to zero, even even when you go below. There, there are sort of uh, a small number of uh, uh, negative curvature directions, but but certainly there is a tilting of the balance in terms of you know if you look at typical uh, configurations there is a change in behavior, but but uh, the, the number doesn't vanish in, in, in that case. Uh, yeah, but here I, I'm not sure if that analysis has been done. Yes? Right. Well, no, so this implies that, uh, sorry, I, I didn't quite understand the question, but the, the, the nearest, right, or, or that the saddle point in question is a minimum, or, or, or the critical point in question is a minimum, right, so, so the index of the saddle points is decreasing as you go to low temperatures. Yeah. High temperature, the closest critical point is a saddle with a given index. Correct. And when you go to this uh, crossover temperature, to this is 0.5, I remember, the closest point is the minimum. Right. But then the barrier can be much higher. I mean, in general, it's much higher than the higher temperature. Correct. Okay. okay. I, I see. Yeah. Right. So, um, I, I think, okay, so I, I don't have the slides here. But uh, uh, there, there has been some calculation of, of, of the, the energy difference going from one saddle, in, one saddle of a given index to the next one. And, and they're roughly, so yeah, so even if you are, so if, if I look below this temperature, um, the system is, is mapping to a local energy minimum, but I don't offhand know uh, uh, information about where the barrier is, okay? But what I can expect is that with the information I have, that the barrier will be uh, of the order of uh, the distance to the, to the next uh, the saddle point of the next index, okay? And, and uh, so the estimate here for the barrier between minima uh, at uh, TC is, is something like uh, 10 times the temp, you know, it's 10 kBT. Uh, that, that is not shown here in, in these slides, but that estimate has been made. Yeah. Right. 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 So, Know, roughly of order epsilon, um, right. but with a tail which is ill-defined because it contains uh, various stuff in it that isn't related right. to you know, cage-breaking processes. Right. Right. So uh, it converges to a finite number. But... All right. So let's take a break and be back here at 10:45. Y axes uh, were plotting. So let, let me just uh, uh, make a simple cartoon. So if I have, let's say, a system with uh, two coordinates, um, if, if the, so a minimum is one where it's, it's a minimum in, in all the directions. Um, so this would, in that notation, correspond to an index of zero. And if it's, if it's a saddle point, I have one minimum direction and one maximum direction, and this would correspond to uh, an index of one. And if I had, this would correspond to n equal to two, et cetera. Okay. Um, and and, and the, the data normalized by the number of, uh, the total number of directions there are. 
Okay. Are there any other questions about this before I go on? Okay. Um, right. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I think I have too many <laughs> slides. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be selective. So, I'm going to skip over uh, a lot of them, and, and if you have any questions, I'll, I'll describe what, what is whizzing by, and, and if you want to stop me, you can stop me. Okay, but uh, so here, um, what I want to describe is having sort of uh, uh, given some uh, reason why we should be looking at the uh, energy landscape uh, and its properties as sample at any given temperature. Uh, I would like to uh, go through uh, the formulation of the thermodynamics of the system in terms of uh, the, the local energy minima and their statistics. And uh, so, um, if I have the partition function of a system, which is proportional with, you know, I'm not going to worry about prefactors, uh, an integral over the configuration space of the exponential of minus beta v, where v is the uh, total interaction potential. Um, I can uh, re rewrite this total partition function as a sum over any a set of non-overlapping sub-volumes which cover the space, right? Um, so this is quite general, um, no justification needed. But um, in this particular context, what I have in mind is that I'm going to subdivide it uh, such that each of the indices alpha here corresponds to the basin of one local minimum, okay? So I'm summing over all the local minima. And again, the total interaction energy, I think there's a typo here, sorry about that. The beta is outside. Well, there should be one more uh, bracket there. Um, the, 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 uh, the interaction energy I can write as the energy at the minimum plus whatever is above the minimum, right? Uh, so, written this way, I can pull out the Boltzmann factor corresponding to the energy of the minimum out of the integral, and the integral here is over the volume of a given basin. <coughs> and uh, now, if I look at this quantity here, uh, I'm basically looking at uh, one basin where the energies are expressed above the, the minimum value. And uh, if I had nice harmonic basins, uh, I, I could so I calculate this quantity easily. And subsequently, we're going to make the assumption that we do have nice harmonic basins. Uh, but we will go one step further uh, and, and sort of demonstrate that, in fact, in some cases, at least, uh, this is, it's valid, okay? Um, but it's not a fundamental assumption. It's just a matter of convenience. But the basic point is this uh, integral here over one basin is sort of what the partition function would look like if I was doing a calculation for a crystal, right? I, I would express my uh, I would express my energies, of course, with respect to the uh, the, the, the ideal crystal uh, energy, and then I assume that I have phonons, and and I do a partition function integral uh, by by calculating first the phonon spectrum, and then I know what to do. Okay, either quantum mechanically or classically. Um, <clears throat> and so that's sort of what we're going to do here. Okay, but because we have um, an in, a, a summation here over an exponential number of you know, different uh, local energy minima, uh, in order to proceed further, uh, we're going to make an assumption, which again can be, can be and has been um, sort of tested uh, numerically at least, which is that um, the, this, this, the the quantity within the, the, the quantity here, which I which I define to be my basin-free energy because of the analogy that I mentioned, um, will not depend on, uh, or, or uh, I guess the right way to say it is, I will not make much of a mistake if I assume that it depends on the energy of the minimum, but not on other details, 
Okay. Therefore, I can index instead of uh, a discrete uh, uh, index for each uh, local minimum, I can think of indexing this basin free energy term in terms of uh, the, the energy of the minimum. Okay. If I do that, this summation here with the replacement of this integral by this expression exponential minus beta uh, basin free energy, um, I can write this now as a sum over all the energies of the local energy minima. But of course, when I do that, uh, I'm going to club together uh, all the minima which have the same energy at the, at the uh, well, which have, which have the same energy. So I have a degeneracy factor here, right? So, well, this is, uh, okay, uh, I kept the summation just to, for continuity, but this is now an integral. I'm, I'm integrating over all the, the range of possible energies of the inherent structures. There's a degeneracy factor, which is the, the density of the, uh, or, yeah, of the minima at a given energy. Okay? And then I had this factor here, which have exponential minus beta phi, which came from here. And then this term has gone here. And as I said, I've, I've thrown away this index alpha, and I'm, I'm assuming that the basin free energy is a function of the energy of the inherent structures. Okay, so and of course, once I, I, I in, in the standard way, I rewrite this to convert this degeneracy factor to an entropy uh, density in the exponent. Okay, so by doing this, I have now <coughs> written the total partition function of the system in terms of basin free energies and configuration entropy density. Um, I mean, if I didn't have the basin free energy, this is sort of the general expression that one writes when one is writing partition functions as a sum over the energy of the states that one has in a system. Okay, so this assumption I, I uh, now, uh, for the sake of simplicity right now, but I, you'll see that this is actually a fairly uh, good description uh, for, for uh, uh, model glass formers that one has studied. Uh, one can sort of make the assumption that um, one has a density of states that is Gaussian, okay? Now, this is a, a reasonable assumption if one is not looking at the tails of the distribution. So, unless, you know, because if, if I can, uh, <coughs> okay, um, uh, <coughs> if, if I, I can think of my system at any, uh, well, I can think of my system as being composed of uh, sort of subunits, each of which will have some distribution of, of uh, possible energies, and uh, near the peak of the distribution through uh, uh, some application of the central limit theorem, I expect a Gaussian distribution. But this will not be valid unless there are more stringent conditions as I go towards the tails of the distribution, okay? In what I'm going to discuss uh, subsequently, I'm going to sort of go through and apply this approximation all the way through, but with this caveat that I've mentioned right now. Okay, um, we will also consider uh, one exceptional case. Okay, so now if I write <coughs> the, 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 the density of states as a Gaussian, my configuration entropy density uh, has this form where this alpha here uh, tells you the total number of states because uh, the, 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 the density of states corresponding to this uh, will be exponential alpha n times a Gaussian function. And uh, so that alpha is just the total number of states. And uh, phi naught is, is the most probable energy for the uh, inherent structures. And sigma is, is the variance, okay? Now, um, so, okay, so this is now one approximation. And the other approximation I already mentioned is that um, I can think of approximating my basins uh, as being harmonic, okay? So, um, <coughs> not too low temperatures, I, I assume that it's, it's a Gaussian. And, and for not too high temperatures, I assume the basins to be harmonic. And, and uh, in, in a previous, uh, lecture uh, describing this, uh, somebody asked me, so at what temperatures is it valid? And I, and I said, uh, 
obviously at intermediate temperatures, <laughs> which is roughly the correct answer because uh, you, you will see exactly what that intermediate temperatures means. But um, so there is some range of temperatures where we hope this will be valid. Okay. Um, so if I have a harmonic uh, basin, I, if I have a method to calculate the, the vibrational frequencies, I can write down the part, I can write down the partition function and, and the basin free energy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is just given in terms of the, the frequencies nu i, where the index, index now is uh, over all eigenvalues. Okay. And uh, now, that's sort of a general description. And even at this level, uh, it's, it's not exactly, I mean, I don't have a concrete expression to work with. Uh, so I'm going to make a further approximation. And, and this is an approximation that's motivated by what you see in, in, in systems where you calculate this. And so as I said, um, uh, okay, so what, what I can think of doing is let's suppose I have some set of uh, frequencies at some reference temperature, right? So I can write the, so the reference temperature, uh, okay, can be infinity, um, or a reference inherent structure energy, which is the max, so I'm choosing it to be the maximum of the distribution. And, and I, I say that I'm going to write my basin free energy always as the basin free energy for the reference uh, configurations, but at whatever temperature I'm looking at, plus a correction which arises from the fact that the basin free, the, the, the frequencies at the minima are changing as I go from inherent structures at one energy to inherent structures at another energy. Okay? And uh, what I'm going to assume now is that this change is linear in the energy of the minima. Okay? And this is neither necessary nor generally valid, but it's, it's, it's observed in some cases, and it has been used uh, as a fairly realistic representation in, in some, some pieces of work. No, it's the maximum of the distribution, so it's the highest minimum right? um, that you will sample physically. <clears throat> okay, so if I do that with, I mean, basically these are all sort of ways in which you simplify the problem so you can write down the answer because now you have a Gaussian density of states and you have a basin free energy that's linear in, in, in energy and, and you can integrate the partition function, you can integrate to get the full partition function, uh, which is a Gaussian integral. And uh, you can then look at different quantities. You can look at the average energy of the minima um, and you, uh, you find that the average energy of the minima that you sample at a given temperature, uh, apart from a constant term, goes as the inverse of the temperature. Okay? And this is, in fact, uh, the result that, uh, I guess, uh, was written down first by Derrida for the random energy model. Uh, this is basically working out to be the same thing. And uh, I can also write down an expression for the configurational entropy. Uh, and just to sort of make that obvious, if I know what the energy as a function of temperature is, if I plug that in, that then I get the configuration entropy as a function of temperature. Okay? And um, now, you will notice, therefore, if this is going as 1 over t, um, I have 1 over t minus something squared, okay? which is um, I can factorize it into a 1 plus t and a 1 minus t term. And, uh, sorry, 1 plus 1 over t and a 1 minus 1 over t term because um, <coughs> the point is what we needed to have the configurational entropy uh, in order to get VFT was that I had a t over tk minus 1 term and a constant in front. Okay? Uh, we don't quite get that if we do all this. Uh, um, of course, we are making approximations about the form of the density of states. So this is what you get with those approximations. But uh, what you do get is an expression for this coefficient. And that is what we are really interested in. And the form of the coefficient tells you that, so if this was a constant, right, from what I told you earlier, this should give me an expression for the fragility. 
right? It is not quite a constant, but if you look at the form of it, which is messy, but I will simplify it in a minute for you. Um, there is a 1 plus Tk over T term, and if I am sufficiently above Tk, this is roughly constant, so it is going to look like a constant, right? Um, but if I look at sort of numbers that describe my energy landscape and ask which of those numbers is relevant for determining the fragility, um, first let me eliminate this delta S here, okay? The delta S was, uh, was the slope for how much my uh, vibrational entropy varied with the energy of the minima. And uh, this actually, you know, at least in a simple-minded case is not very significant, so I can say, assume that it's, it's constant, right? So, um, so this delta S will then become zero. So if I <coughs> get rid of delta S, basically I'm left with this combination here, which is sigma square root of alpha. And if you ask what is that combination, uh, it, it'll, it's basically the, the span of your density of states over which you have finite uh, configurational entropy. It's how broad, yeah? Yeah. So the the SC is basically the density of states, right? Of yeah. of the of the minima, and so is the last but one equation. That's an independent assumption. No, last but from the bottom, SC is proportional to t minus t k minus one. That that's a no. that's an independent assumption, or is it no, is no, it no. derived from the? See, basically, I had um, so I had um, this partition function to calculate. Yeah. I, I made an assumption that this is Gaussian. Okay. And I made a further assumption that this is linear in phi. So I can do that integration. So that's the answer you get if you make those assumptions. Okay. So so that's derived from those two assumptions. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So um, so basically, uh, what you get out of this is a sort of a a, a satisfactory answer to what determines the fragility of a system, and the answer is that uh, if, if your distribution of inherent structure energies is broader, uh, your fragility will be higher. Or conversely, if you have a very narrow distribution of inherent structure energies, then you will have a strong uh, glass former. Okay? So, um, okay. And... Um, Okay, so it came from a combination of, uh, so here in the beginning of the lecture, I, right, so I, 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 I told you that if my temperature times delta S had this form, right, this constant here determined the fragility because I could plug this into the VFT functional form, et cetera, yeah? So wh what, I, what I show here is, <clears throat> okay, so th that I've sort of roughly got something which looks like that, and I'm trying to understand, uh, you know, if, if I simplify it sufficiently, what do I get out as the answer for what determines the fragility? And the answer is that uh, it's, it's, it's the, the, the breadth of the distribution of minima that determines the fragility, okay? Sorry? <laughs> oh, which, that, that's, okay, here it's no longer delta S because what I said earlier was that the delta S in, in, that we normally calculate is a surrogate for the configurational entropy that is associated with the degeneracy of local minima, which is what I'm calculating now. Yeah. Uh, you will see. 
there is there is a the case of silica that I will show. Uh, where is Peter? There he is. In case you have complicated questions, but uh, that will show that particular case, right? Um, okay. So um, yeah. So I, I before I go on, let me just sort of quickly say that based on the sort of the expressions that I've written down, there were sort of these few numbers that that determined the the landscape as far as the thermodynamics was concerned, uh, namely the total number of states and the, 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 the breadth of the distribution uh, and, uh, and, and the, the energy of the most probable uh, inherent structures. <coughs> so now the, what I had in mind, even though I didn't state it explicitly, was that I was looking at a canonical ensemble, right? So I, I was sitting at one particular volume, yeah? But so I can ask, you know, what, what is going to happen if I change the volume of the system, right? And uh, so one way of describing uh, the change uh, in the volume of the system is to say that the parameters that describe the energy landscape are going to be, are going to change. And, and so th those numbers, if I am going to be looking at something other than a canonical ensemble or, or if I needed to bring into consideration the dependence on the volume of the system, I will treat those numbers as functions of the volume of the system, or the density of the system, right? So if I do that, then, um, uh, well, okay. So in this part, in this uh, uh, partition function, um, so this alpha is a function of volume, this phi naught is a function of volume, sigma is a function of volume, and so forth. And now, if I um, write down the free energy, that will be implicitly a function of volume, right? And the free energy had the simple form. I had the energy, the most probable energy of the minimum, uh, the configurational entropy that corresponded to it, and the vibrational free energy that corresponded to it. And now, if I were to look at the change in the free energy when I change the volume, uh, the obvious quantity to look at is the pressure because that is the derivative of the free, Helmholtz free energy if I change the volume of the system or if I differentiate with respect to the volume. And, but the nice thing is this way of writing uh, the free energy uh, gives me a handle on sort of trying to understand what contributions to the pressure come from where. Okay, because there are terms that depend on, so this is clearly a vibrational free energy. So uh, any, uh, uh, so, th so the, the derivative of this term, I'll say is, is a vibrational component of the, the pressure. And, and uh, the rest of it is the inherent, I'm going to call it, or Francesco Shortino and colleagues call it the inherent structure contribution of the pressure. Okay, and um, okay. Uh, we'll come back to this uh, again at the end of the talk, but I just mention it here uh, because it's sort of a, uh, an extension of whatever I said earlier. So now we go back to um, various things that I've said. One is uh, the assumption of the harmonicity of the basins. Now, before I, I proceed, let me say that, you know, this assumption is not really necessary to do everything that we're doing, except um, some things will become more complicated. Right, um, and similarly, the significance of what I'm going to say regarding the harmonicity or otherwise should be taken a with a little bit of um, caution, um, <clears throat> because uh, for, you know. So the results I'm going to show you are for a Leonard-Jones mixture that I mentioned earlier, the Cobb-Anderson Leonard-Jones mixture. But for the case of water, right, um, the 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 vibrate the the basins are never quite, they're never harmonic. So you have to do something different. And the analysis that I'm going to present in that case will have to be done differently, okay? So with that caveat, um, uh, let me proceed. So based on the partition function that I wrote, the probability of finding at a given temperature uh, inherent structures of a given energy uh, are given by the the Boltzmann weight that was inside the partition function integral, the energy of the minima, the basin free energy, and the configurational entropy density. 
uh, normalized by the total partition function. Okay. Now, if I had a way, uh, and, and, and in, in, in computer simulations one does, of finding this distribution function. So all I have to do in a simulation is to run a simulation, generate the samples of uh, instantaneous configurations that I minimize, and I build a histogram of uh, energies. Okay. And uh, if I had a way of calculating the total partition function, which is to say the total free energy of the system, um, which I do uh, because uh, there, is a, there are various methods, but the particular one that, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, you, you guys use that to, but I, I guess you didn't use the normalization, you, you didn't use it for normalization, but you did the thermodynamic integration to calculate the total free energy. Um, so this, this is available. And um, so then if I, now I'm left, so if I, if I know these two things reliably, I'm left with the validity of my assumption about the basin free energy. Uh, and if, if I make valid assumptions about this, I should get good estimates of the configuration entropy by inverting this relationship. Okay, so this is one way of checking whether if I made a, uh, an assumption about the harmonicity of the basins, if that assumption is valid, because I can do all this calculation for different temperatures, and if I'm doing things consistently, I'm going to get an estimate of the configuration entropy density that's going to agree with each other. Okay, so um, we do that. And uh, what you find, this is actually, okay, results for different densities of the system. Uh, it doesn't matter, it's just independent, different data sets as far as you're concerned. Uh, what you find is that when you do this analysis for a range of low temperatures, um, your results agree very well with each other. So there's sort of a bunch of symbols here which you can't resolve very well because they all sit on top of each other. But as you keep going to higher temperatures, at some temperature you find that um, the, your, your estimated density of states uh, is, is, is uh, departing from your estimates from lower temperatures, okay? So that means that you, something is breaking down and uh, uh, since there was only, you know, since I, we trust the, that we know how to do thermodynamic integration and we have enough samples of the local energy minima to build good histograms, the only thing that can go wrong is, is the assumption of harmonicity of the basins, okay? And, and so uh, you can say, okay, so the, uh, there is a temperature at which this is breaking down. Yeah. Sorry? It's the, the Cobb-Anderson mixture, yeah? <coughs> okay. So, um, so for, uh, okay. So now uh, I can also uh, interrogate the harmonicity of the basins by comparing the excitation energy above the minima uh, of my system in equilibrium uh, with what I would expect if, if the system was harmonic, right? So uh, what I expect if the system is harmonic is, is that uh, I have a linear dependence on the temperature of the excitation energy, right? And so I, I plot things in a way that it's, it's clear, but basically, here I'm putting the inherent structure energies on the x-axis, and I'm, uh, but this is a stand-in for the temperature because there's a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, and here uh, is the difference of the instantaneous energies uh, and the expectation based on the harmonic approximation, okay? And what you find is that, um, again, it's fairly, fairly good uh, at, at over some temperature range, but then it's breaking down, okay? And, uh, okay, we move on. Um, I, as I already mentioned, uh, we have the assumption of this, oh, sorry, based on the Gaussian density of states, I had this prediction of a one over T temperature dependence of uh, the enhanced structure energies with temperature, and that's also something I can check. And what I find is that for each of these densities that I look at, there is some range over which this is valid, but there are departures. This is one over T here, so it's, it's, uh, that this is high temperature. So there are departures as I go to sufficiently high temperatures, 
Okay, so um, so these are sort of different ways in which I, I, I identify the range over which the assumptions that I made are valid, and a range over which it's not valid. And uh, so the interesting uh, thing is, uh, okay, this is. Don't take that too seriously. This is noisy data because the, the, the temperatures sampled were discrete. Uh, but uh, uh, within those limitations, what you find is that all of these different temperatures match with each other, and they match with the onset temperature that I mentioned to you uh, earlier. Okay. So basically, the, the upshot of all this is that there is a meaningful uh, onset temperature as a function of density, in, at least in this system, below which all the assumptions that I've stated work fairly well. <clears throat> okay, I think I'll skip over this. Um, uh, this is just sort of some other properties that change uh, uh, as you go across this, this onset temperature, but I don't have uh, time for this. Uh, okay, so this is sort of uh, just a, a map uh, of, of different things that we've talked about. We've talked about the onset temperature. We've talked about this Goldstein crossover or the mode coupling temperature identified with each other, the glass transition temperature, and, and the Skousman or the Fogel temperature. Okay? Um, that's just to, um, that's sort of the sequence in which they appear. Uh, most of the computer simulations are done in this range. And I'll refer back to that later on uh, in a bit. Okay, so um, I've already sort of said the things that I need to say about the calculation of fragility. Um, what I show here are some comparisons of the fragility that one can calculate based on um, uh, looking at the dynamics, the diffusivity in this case, and the thermodynamic fragility that I calculated. And along the way, we also look at how well the Adam-Gibbs relation is valid, okay? And uh, so this is log diffusivity versus 1 over T times SC, which should give you uh, linear plots. Um, and and uh, for all these different densities of the system, you do get these linear plots. Uh, but there are a couple of things which are a bit um, funny, uh, because, <coughs> you know, if you look at this data, uh, it's not really predictive, if, you know, it's because if, if with the Adam-Gibbs relation, um, you, you, if you knew the configuration entropy, you should be able to predict the diffusivity, right? And that's clearly not the case here because um, for a given, conf well, combination of TSC, I have quite a variation of the diffusivity depending on the density that I have. So there is some additional density dependence which one should understand better, um, but yeah. Right. No. No. So what? So if I tell you the configuration entropy and one normalization constant for the diffusivity, then it's predictive. But that that sort of reference diffusivity changes with density and there is no explanation for that in this level, right? Um, of course, the other issue which hasn't been looked at, uh, I, I guess, in this context carefully enough is, is what difference it will make to look at the viscosity versus uh, the diffusivity because in principle it should make a difference, right? But with those caveats, um, Okay, all of this I can skip. This is uh, just sort of, you know, data to show that this linear assumption of the vibrational frequency is actually uh, good for this system, but it's also been found to be good for various other systems. Um, as also, you know, okay, I won't say anything about the Gaussian uh, density of states assumption because um, if this is a actually a, a, a vignette of what part of the density of states you're looking at, and it's a fairly small part in all the cases. So, uh, if, if it's not a straight line, it's a Gaussian. I mean, it's it's uh, it's, uh, it's not to be, you know. But but we do expect that 
you know, like I said, uh, we do check for the 1 over t dependence and it's valid over a, a substantial range. Okay. Um, right. So, um, okay. So that's uh, a comparison of the thermodynamic and, and the, the kinetic uh, fragilities that one calculates and, and, and within some limits uh, and, and the caveats I mentioned, they seem to agree. But um, this is an analysis that can be, you know, so as far as the thermodynamics is concerned, uh, what, what I showed you is what you can do. I mean, the, the assumptions about the nature of the density of states, etc., can change. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, you expect that if Adam Gibbs works, uh, there's a certain uh, route to calculating the fragility of the systems. And here is one example now where the assumption about the density of states does not work. Okay, uh, which is the case of silica, <coughs> and um, um, so as you heard already, silica is, is the standard example for a strong uh, uh, glass former. And uh, what, however, the work of various people, including Walter and Peter, and I guess those are the Austin is not here, but uh, he had some role in the the work in mines, right, um, uh, showed is that if you look at a model of silica on silica at high enough temperatures, you do find uh, non arrhenius temperature dependence, okay. So what you see uh, is that you go from sort of a fragile behavior to strong behavior as you go to low temperatures. And um, <clears throat> on the other hand, if you look at the the Adam Gibbs plot of the diffusivity versus 1 over TSC, uh, you do find a convincing uh, uh, Adam Gibbs behavior. Okay? So what is happening? Uh, what is happening is that uh, the Gauss assumption of a Gaussian density of states and uh, correspondingly uh, uh, a 1 over T dependence of the energies of the local minima uh, is not obeyed in this system. So what you see, uh, this is plotted against temperature. As you come to low temperatures, there is sort of a, a hint of things uh, flattening out. And uh, this is now plotted against 1 over T, and that makes it more obvious that in, in the case of this lower density here, uh, you're seeing departures from uh, 1 over t behavior that are significant. And uh, I don't have the data to show here, but if you ask what kind of a, a change in the density of states it corresponds to, what it corresponds to is, is something like a, a chopping off of the density of states. So the density of states effectively becomes narrower uh, as you go to um, so, so SC as a function of phi is, is parabolic if, it's, if you have a Gaussian density of states, but if you have a change that is sharper as you go to low energies, then effectively the system has a narrower density of states uh, when you're at low temperatures and that corresponds, as I described to you earlier, uh, stronger behavior, okay? And this is, uh, uh, this is, yeah. Sorry? Yes. Well, it's dropping faster when you plot it against energy. But what you have to ask yourself is what happens as you vary the temperature. Right. So what happens as you vary the temperature is that the system will, will basically get stuck 
in a very small range of energies and that is uh, that corresponds to strong behavior okay um, right so yeah you're reaching an energy limit um, the the inherent structures are reaching a limit at which you, you can't produce inherent structures of lower energy and if you see on the plot uh, the zero temperature black square uh, in the main plot is the crystal energy uh -huh. and so you can get a an energetic sense of why this inherent structure energy can't keep diving down with negative curvature it's got a, it, it's reaching a, a limit and the states are piling up against that limit and so the the distribution is narrowing point um, okay um, right so um, okay um, let me now skip a whole lot of slides <laughs> well okay so maybe I say a little bit what what is here okay um, basically the same uh, in, in fact the, the data that I showed and, and the analysis that I showed can be used to calculating a line of glass transition, ideal glass transitions in the system and you can ask the question how that line of glass transitions is, is, is uh, um, related to the other limit to the liquid state which is a liquid gas spinoral and uh, what you find is that these two limits to the liquid state uh, beyond which a liquid cannot exist as a homogeneous stably or metastably in equilibrium system uh, intersect at a finite temperature and uh, this has the uh, consequence this is the the estimated glass transition line and this is the estimated spinodal line liquid gas spinodal yeah it's the same uh, system the Cobb Anderson mixture yeah and uh, so those two lines intersect at a finite temperature so if you look uh, below that uh, below that temperature you actually have a prediction of a, a, a mechanical stability limit to the glass which I, I okay uh, but okay so one of the things we also did but uh, you'll actually hear it from Mark uh, is to sort of do the calculation also through the, the approach that uh, Mazard and Parisi uh, developed. I guess you are going to describe that. And, and we find sort of not numerically uh, consistent but, but qualitatively a, a consistent picture of, of what's happening. Okay. Um, skip, skip, skip. Okay. So I think this is sort of the uh, <clears throat> the last uh, bit that I'll, I'll talk about um, <clears throat> which is um, <clears throat> the, the analysis of systems that are not in equilibrium uh, using this picture and, and I'll, I'll say a few words why it is appealing to think of it this way um, <clears throat> because uh, as I mentioned when I described to you the equation of state that was written in terms of the energy landscape parameters um, I said there was a nice way to separate what was happening within individual basins and what was happening uh, to the inherent structure component of, of, of the equation of state and, um, and I had also said earlier much earlier that uh, the reason for thinking about this uh, energy landscape picture was this intuitive idea that uh, local equilibration of the system was always fast whereas equilibration that required hopping between local minima was the slow process okay so when you're looking at aging systems with this perspective um, you can say you know a good way to think about what happens when I uh, take a system out of equilibrium is that first I will thermalize the system within a given basin but there will be a much slower process through which the system will uh, sample uh, or, or, or approach the equilibrium sampling of, of the, the basins uh, 
in, uh, that are appropriate for the new temperature. Let's say if I do a temperature quench, uh, there will be a different distribution of uh, basins that should be sampled. And, and the, the approach to that this, uh, sampling will be much, a much slower process, right? So, um, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, now, what we have already uh, sort of discussed at some length is, is sort of, I mean, not, not at length, but I did make reference to it a few times, is that uh, I can think of the energy of the inherent structures that I'm sampling uh, when I'm in equilibrium as, as an alternative way of describing the state of the system. So for every temperature, I had a corresponding inherent structure energy. But if I'm not in equilibrium, then uh, while the sampling of, of the individual basin that I might be sitting at at any given instant is rapid and, and, and will thermalize, what will take longer is for me to reach the appropriate energies of the local minima, right? Now, this is now an additional new slow variable. And uh, uh, one can think of developing an approach to describe out of equilibrium behavior by saying that this is one additional parameter that I need to know. Uh, and if I knew that, I could, I could say everything. I, I, I could fully characterize the system, even if it is out of equilibrium. Okay? And so this was something that uh, uh, these guys tried. And, uh, okay, so here is a, I forgot, the, the, the ca nice cartoon of, the, of what I was trying to say. Uh, so imagine that each of these lines represents the free energy of this system if it was just sitting in one uh, basin, right? Um, and, and let's say that each of these lines corresponds to inherent structures at different energies, right? Uh, so if I were to take a system that's sitting here and do a rapid quench, what happens is it'll rapidly go along this line where it's thermalizing now to the new temperature very quickly but then it will make a much slower transition across these different minima, okay? So uh, because the real process is separated in this manner, what we want to do is to see if we can also separate our description in the same fashion and, and if it makes sense, okay? And uh, so, again, uh, this is uh, uh, rewriting the free energy of the system in terms of the configurational entropy uh, plus the basin free energy. So this now subsumes uh, the energy at the minimum that I had before explicitly. And uh, <clears throat> if I wanted to find the most probable energy, uh, what I would normally do is to take the derivative of this, uh, which I do now also, uh, and set it to zero. But instead of um, saying that this is a condition for me to determine uh, the inherent structure energy uh, at a given temperature in equilibrium. I'm going to now say that, in addition, I'm also going to specify what this energy is, okay? So then the question is, what, what do I gain by, by it, okay? So one by one, so I specify what my inherent structure energy is, and I also specify that the equilibrium or the temperature of the bath. And, and I say that this is the temperature that has to go into um, the vibrational part of the free energy because the vibrational thermalization is always rapid. So whatever the bath temperature will be the vibration, the temperature that goes into the vibrational free energy. But I now say that this, um, the temperature that's sitting in front of the configurational part I'm going to say is not determined by the bath, but by the inherent structure energy that I'm sampling for a given system at a given time, right? And, and so if I do that, then this equation becomes a condition for the value of that temperature. Okay, so I have rewriting this, a temp, uh, an expression for the, sorry, notations keep changing, uh, but uh, 
yeah, I have an expression for what they call the internal temperature, where F is the final temperature, so keeping in mind uh, of a quench from an initial to a final temperature. And uh, so, uh, so you have this stuff here, which is, uh, so F basin was the energy of the inherent structure plus the vibrational free energy. So that's the one plus this guy, and, and this quantity went to the denominator. So the long and short of it is you have now an expression for the internal temperature as a function of the energy uh, of the minima that you sample when your system is aging, okay? So what do you do with this? Um, what these guys did was to, yeah? If I assume what? That the shape of the basin is the same. No. Nope. No, so this is indeed the term that arises that is finite if you don't make that assumption. Okay. So this is what uh, Austin was asking about two days ago, and I said I'll talk about it. Yes. And uh, you decrease the temperature, the states go go closer in free energy. You have a contraction of free space, and this is the origin of the term. I mean, at least this is the way I explained right. it to Shirley. No, but contraction. In, in I mean, you have no contraction. Energy levels. Correct. That is fine. That is that is here. By a certain range. I suppose the total number of energy level is the same. And then if they approach each other, you have a contraction Correct. of phase space, and this is the origin of that term. Not right, the but fact that the size of the basins is not the same. The size, is not, the size of the relevant basin, by assumption, if you use that, is the same. This is what we discussed with uh, Miguel Virasoro uh, in a paper that preceded yes. that one. Well, this is the inherent structure talk. I was going to mention that. But no, but this here is the derivative of the vibrational free energy with respect to the energy of the minima, right? So, I mean, so if, if, if I had no dependence of the vibrational free energy on the energy of the minima, that term will be zero. Huh? I go on. <laughs> He's saying neither yes nor no. So, okay. Um, okay. So, anyway, uh, you are going to talk about this. Okay. Um, so, we can. Um, right. So, um, um, yeah, I, I guess uh, uh, I won't go through the details of this, but what this was used to is to calculate uh, the violation or, or is to look at this so-called FDT ratio, uh, which is, um, uh, so if you have the FDT relation between, you know, where, where the temperature here in equilibrium is the, the bath temperature, but if the fluctuation dissipation theorem is violated, then this temperature is, oops, 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 oops. Hmm. Uh, uh. Huh? Early. Okay. Oh, I skipped there. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, <coughs> okay, so um, so this temperature is, is not the bath temperature if, if, if the system is, is not in equilibrium necessarily. And um, what was is shown here is the plotting of of the the uh, yeah the correlation sorry the yeah this is the correlation function and that's the response and uh, 
the lines that are drawn through are the slopes that correspond to the internal temperature that's calculated through the procedure that I described. And uh, what you see is, is, is that, in fact, you are able to, in this case, capture uh, uh, that, that internal temperature uh, through this means. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, maybe this is something that, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I think, uh, okay, so other stuff I'll k skip except to say here that as who, yeah, somebody mentioned the coax effect, effect right, um, which was sort of men described as, as an illustration that uh, even if you try to invoke additional internal parameters or an additional internal param parameter, uh, it is not sufficient to describe the, uh, the, the state of, of, of an aging system, and that's indeed also the conclusion in this case. Um, won't go to the details. I think I'll skip that. Okay. So, um, Okay, so this is sort of a summary of what I've uh, uh, described. Uh, the analysis of dynamics and liquids through the energy landscape approach provides a useful way of understanding some processes leading to relaxation. But, you know, not only what I presented, but in general, I would say that uh, we don't really have a satisfactory dynamical description that is based on, on this approach. And this is uh, a serious uh, limitation. There have been attempts, and, and in fact, you can, you can if, if you, I mean, you can, you can certainly do some calculations uh, with, with a, an in principle correct dynamical description, but whether it's, it's sort of satisfactory in terms of giving you a handle on how to think about uh, the system is a different story. Um, and, and also, I, you know, I, I mentioned a lot the Adam-Gibbs relation, and that sort of comes up as a central uh, concept uh, in, in trying to relate an energy landscape description to dynamics. And, and we don't really have, certainly from this approach, uh, a, a satisfactory uh, understanding of why this relation is valid. And that's, uh, that's one of the uh, major goals, I would say, in pursuing this or any other uh, line of inquiry that, that sort of attempts to understand the dynamics of the system through some form of a landscape uh, picture. And um, um, okay, so the other point, which was the content of, of this slide here, but I won't sort of, is, is, that, is, a, is the observation that um, according to some uh, ideas about uh, what is happening in, in, in structural glasses, uh, there is sort of these two regimes uh, above and below the mode coupling temperature. And, and, you know, expectations, including uh, Goldstein's original proposal, um, are that a landscape picture and activated dynamics, etc., are valid at temperatures below. Uh, the, this, this crossover temperature, but what we find uh, through this, th through the work that I presented here and other works, is that um, there is uh, an applicability of a landscape uh, 
a picture at temperatures much higher than what we might have expected. And, and this is uh, also a regime where, by other uh, measures, uh, mode coupling theory also works very well. And uh, this, this combination of facts is a bit of a puzzle. And uh, Sarika, who's not here anymore, oh, there she is, uh, will sort of talk about some attempts to sort of rationalize this. But I think that's an important problem um, to be taken up further. OK, I'll stop. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, the configuration entropy should count the number of possible configurations in which one can uh, make a glass. Now, um, the identification of, uh, uh, I mean, of, of inherent structures as states in which a glass can uh, found is certainly very interesting. It leads to a beautiful results. However, it leads to some, uh, to some uh, conceptual problem because, I mean, you could have very small rearrangement of configurations that uh, uh, change you from uh, uh, inherent structure to an inherent structure to another, but leaves you in the same uh, glassy configuration. And there is a, uh, an extremely, I mean, there is an argument which is, which is due by, uh, to, uh, to Stillinger that actually tells you that this kind of na narrowing of the configuration entropy, which was depicted on, uh, on the blackboard, inevitably uh, occurs if you identify the configurational entropy with, with, uh, with uh, the inner and structure multiplicity. Right. In, particular, uh, in particular, you cannot have, I mean, in particular, the possibility of an ideal, phase, uh, an ideal glass transition is related to the fact that at the ground state, the slope of the configuration entropy is finite, and you find that if you identify with, uh, with uh, inner and structure, this is always infinite, mm -hmm. and so you, could, you couldn't. So, I mean, I think that one should take care um, yeah. well, to um, this problem. No, so the, the two comments about that. Uh, one is, uh, in fact, I didn't even uh, uh, skip the slide, but I, I had a slide there about meta basins, which, which uh, I didn't even mention. But uh, there wasn't much on that slide. Uh, I was going to apologize for not covering that topic. Uh, so there has been an attempt to sort of go beyond looking at uh, uh, inherent structures as defined by local energy minima to collect groups of inherent structures somehow, which, which are called meta basins, which will in principle rectify this, this problem. Uh, I, I think it's an interesting thing to do. It's, it's a very messy and difficult thing to do properly. Uh, David will say something about it in the afternoon. Um, so, and in fact, the, what, what, they, what he's going to describe sounds, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, one, one of the problems that I've sort of had with this metabasin work is, is that you're trying to, you know, at some level, you, you have this hierarchy of, you know, like Walter said, if you have the Hamiltonian, you should be able to calculate uh, structure, perhaps. Well, he didn't put it that way, but but you sort of, for, for looking at dynamics, uh, you want to be able to build that on the basis of structural and equilibrium properties that you assume to be known. Uh, but in the metabasin analysis of uh, uh, Andreas Hoyer, I mean, it's not a criticism, but what they've had to do is, is to look at, a, look at the dynamics itself in order to determine what a meta basin is. And, and that's sort of not, that's a first step, but you have to go further. And, and what David is going to talk about uh, will, will, will indicate one, one direction in which one could go. Yeah. Apply right. uh, at that point. Right. No, but, but, I, but I think. Uh, OK, sorry. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, yeah, no, let me, let me say it, and I'll, I'll come. I, uh, elaborate. Um, no, he said that the Stillinger argument will hold at the very bottom of the landscape, right? Uh, but 
so yeah, that was a, that was David's comment. Um, I I think uh, you know if if in a strict sense, even though it sort of looks like a rigorous argument of some sort, uh, if you think about uh, I mean, I've, I've sort of worried my head about that as well. Uh, but if you think about a crystal, right, where you don't have much of a problem thinking of a, a, a crystal with defects as, as defining a, a very well-defined state. Um, so if you knew everything you wanted to know, you wouldn't have a problem with inherent structures either. We just don't know how to sort of... Uh, We call a state, <laughs> but uh, it, yeah. So, it, it, but but on the other hand, uh, it, I I think uh, yeah, looking at inherent structures is, is is okay. I mean, I'm I'm not worried about the extra states that you generate by making defects. I'm more worried about what you don't know about the phase space connectivity and how that affects uh, your picture of what's going on if you go through this. Approach. Okay, um, I think that's a good place to stop.